Yes. You don't have to if you don't want to. All right, go ahead. Then. Okay. <laughs> We've already taken enough time from you. Here we are. Um, I hope you can see that. So my name is Katie. Um, I am with Mad Security, and I'm going to talk about diamonds, fitness, and quotes, manipulation for fun and profit. Um, I was making the talk. Okay, come on, Melissa. Oh no. Of course, this isn't going to work. Whatever. I'll just click it on here. Um, so I was making my talk, and I was trying to figure out. Um, I was trying. I can't touch that. Okay, so I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do. And I went through several renditions. At first, my original concept was, we're going to talk about the history of human manipulation. Let's learn from our mistakes. Because there's a lot of mistakes that happen. Um, and it's always good to know what they are. Because, I mean, just like any other situation, if you know the history, then you're going to know how to use it to your advantage. But I started writing it, and it sounded way too much like when I taught undergrads. It's a big old history lesson. I didn't think it was appropriate, so I moved on. And I wonder if you had to get your dog to fetch a beer. Lessons in training anything or anyone. And it was good and it was fun. And I, again, started to make it. But then I started thinking about what I wanted you guys to walk away with. And I realized what you were going to walk away with was some scary information. In which case, everyone's going to run around trying to train everyone to do every little thing. You're going to try to train your friend to do the mock random before touching the TV. Um, your dogs are going to be doing weird stuff. So I was like, I don't want to be responsible for that. At something like these sides. And the whole black hat. DEF CON amalgamation of everything. So I moved on and finally came to, fuck it, let's just drink and make some bad decisions. So um, that's what we're going to do. That was a joke, guys. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Good job. I'm going to cue those jokes. I'm going to drink, uh, mainly because I drank a lot last night. And um, I have to be alert. So there we go. So this is what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about a variety of things. And the first thing is going to be, how do you scare someone into a date? Believe it or not, everything I'm going to talk about is small, subtle things that are based in psychology and manipulation. Um, small things you can do to get anything you want. So one of the things that happened a long time ago is there was a... Does anyone know what bridge this is? Anyone know? It's, it's a very tall suspension bridge. I feel like it's not. It's, close. it's not close, but I want to give you some credit for trying. Um, it's, in, it's outside of Vancouver, right? It's out of Vancouver. It's a suspension bridge really high, right? You can look down and try to show really good perspective. And what ends up happening is people cross it. It's a big tourist attraction. And when you get to the other side, you have this heightened sense of arousal. And we're not talking sex here. We're just talking about your excitement. Well, researchers wanted to look into this idea of how do you get someone to like you? Like, what is going on here chemistry-wise? And what they did is they decided to hit some, put some hot girl at the end of the bridge. Or at the beginning of the bridge. So let's say it was Megan Fox. Um, she had it a lot put on since this was science. Um, <laughs> so Megan Fox, so people, they, they go across the bridge, and at the end, we have Megan Fox, or somebody of similar hotness. And she simply asks them, hey, how did you like your experience? This is exciting. If you have any other questions for me, here's my number. Feel free to contact me. And the actual study was, who contacts her? How many people are going to contact her? Um, and what they ended up finding out was that all these people were contacting her, not only for questions, but to ask her on a date. So, but that wasn't the only thing, too. They actually put her, at the, at some, for some people, at the beginning of the bridge, before they had this heightened sense of arousal, to see, like, oh, it's going to happen. Nobody called her on that one. They are just like, yeah, whatever. I don't care. So what they ended up finding out is that people get this heightened sense of arousal when they cross the bridge. They saw a hot girl. She was nice. So they attributed that arousal to her. That she misplaced the experience onto herself. So essentially, getting somebody to trick you into a date. So that's where you get like, you know, anyone that uh, I talk to about, uh, what do you do on a first date? And people are like, oh, sit, sit at dinner. I'm like, yes, that's great. Put her into a food coma. That's really going to get your chances real high. Um, but no, people that are like, we went on a roller coaster. Usually those dates end, end well. Do you understand what I'm saying? Um, because yeah, you get your date into a heightened sense of arousal. You smile at them, and then they're like, I must like you. <laughs> this is great. And this is why this guy gets dates. So, um, and so that's, this is this concept of how to trick someone into a date. Um, it's, it's this idea you're essentially hijacking their subjective experience. You know exactly what's going to happen. You put them in a situation. Um, that you know what's going to happen. I mean, it could be in the negative manner as well. Let's say that you want somebody to leave you alone. You put them in a heightened sense of arousal. Um, you piss them off. They're a lot more likely to, one, hate you, and two, want to fight with you. 
Um, so that's another way to kind of egg people on. So this is this idea of trick someone into a date. This is what we've done. This is exciting. Now we know. But let's just say that we're talking about these two. Love prevails. And now it's time to buy some diamonds. Everyone knows what diamonds are, right? How many of you guys are married? Some of you, right? How many of you had to buy a wedding ring or received a, a diamond ring? Okay. Uh, guys, how many of you really understood that and why? A couple of you. Chris, oh, you just because she's, she's in the room? No. Okay. She's in her speaker room. Okay, last time she was in the room. I asked something about being happily married and Chris was like, hey, <laughs> I'm so happily married. My wife is right there, so yeah. happy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, Chris is always saying, hey, uh, raising his hand. So we have diamonds here. And it's actually a really interesting story. Does anyone know the story of how the diamond became a sign of love and all that stuff? No? Okay. The beers. Well, yeah. Tell us, Katie. Oh, thank you. Did you have a question? No, I know. Oh, good, good. <laughs> so then you can add. Um, so you can blame for all of you either men that had to buy the diamond ring and you were pissed about it, or for all you women that are like, why do I have a diamond ring? Blame it on this guy. His name's Cecil Rhodes. And basically, a long time ago, down uh, when everyone's trying to colonize to get over to the spice area, they had to stop in South Africa and then swoop around. People stopped in South Afri Africa and then all of a sudden they realized there were diamonds down there and they went crazy. And there's a whole bunch of story behind that. But people were getting all of these diamonds because that this is great. And this guy went down and essentially got a monopoly over it. And he could because it was down in South Africa. He bought up all the mines. Um, by, by the time he died, De Beers had a nine, had ninety percent of the world's diamonds in their vault, and they locked it. And they're like, "Nope, oh, good." There's tons of diamonds out there. Um, the thing about it, though, is what he did. It's, it's it's not rare at all. There's so many other types of diamonds. Like there's one called a tanzanite. Most people don't know about it. It's extremely rare. Nobody wants it. But we've we've outlined it like already. Um, but what they ended up doing is they manipulated the crowd. They took all of them. They locked them away, made it rare. They're like, oh, there's not that many of them. We're only going to release this many. That means there's not that much. And then they came over to the United States where the market and the marketing team was relatively cheesy and easy. Um, and they said, this is the rock of love. This, if you love her, you give this to her. And we bought it. We absolutely bought it. What, what he did is it's very big on behavioral economics and that he made it a rare commodity. Um, even if you're lying, like you can do similar to with back to the date concept. Similar with this, you have this idea that uh, all those kind of games that everyone likes to play and they're really poorly played now, they're rooted in this concept. If you're like, oh, I, ca I called you, I'm not going to call you for a couple days, you're making yourself a rare commodity. So that all of a sudden, back to hijacking the subjective experience, they go, oh, I wonder, oh, I can't talk to you. I, well, I wanted this, but I can't get it because everybody's not everybody has it. I really want it now. So this suddenly, hence the reason you see on those shows, they're like, we only have five left. We only have 25 left. They count down because they're making it a diminishing commodity. So you suddenly feel, oh my gosh, I need this. So that's what happened with diamonds. It was, it was just delightful. Everyone bought it. Everyone's like, oh great, everyone has to have diamonds. Unfortunately, um, all of a sudden, the diamonds industry started going down. So then De Beers brought in a diamond is forever. So not only, which is now what they do all the time, and they just went the extra step. They said it's rare, it's love, and you're telling her it's forever. All in one rock. Isn't that amazing? Um, so it's actually, like I said, it's actually quite hilarious because there's, um, I actually have friends, both male and female, which is not all that. Um, so, and even if they're not the biggest fan of, of diamonds, for some reason, they feel weird not having a diamond as their wedding ring. It's like it's a judgment. For some, some people were like, forget it, give me a topaz. Like, <laughs> I'm on it. Um, but it's odd because it's been ingrained for so long as a social norm of that is the sign of love. It is forever. It, at one point, they even uh, started calling it, since it's a really hard rock, um, they started calling it resilient to time. It is timeless because it is resilient. I mean, it's really weird. Because essentially, they didn't come over and go, yeah, we found this rock. It's clear. Nothing special there. Um, it's shiny. It's kind of hard. And uh, buy it. They didn't do that. They stole subjective experience. They manipulated the situation and have continued to do that. And there's entire industries based on this. You have the Tiffany diamond. It is the sign of love, which is ridiculous. 
But then it also, which is great, now that we all know this, and we also have, you know, pessimism, we also have parodies out there, like, if we said you would chop off your arm, if you really loved her, you'd probably be stupid enough to do that. De Beers, it's just a rock. I found several of these, I like them a lot. We also have, 50 years from now, she's not going to lovingly recall the time you gave her a salad spinner. <laughs> a diamond is forever. Please get better. Hey, what do you think? What do you know? She thinks you're funny again. Diamonds are forever. And then we have another one. No tech support required. Diamonds are forever. And this is one of my personal favorites. Because you felt a 60 second blowjob was worth $50 a second. <laughs> a diamond is forever. And it gets to the main concept, which is, fuck love, just give me diamonds. So that's pretty much what we have here. And it's hilarious because you even have women that will, I mean, sometimes men, that feel the same way. It's just, I want diamonds. My friend is getting ready to get married. I'm not terribly jazzed about that. Um, but it was really funny. I let her try some of my rings on to be like, what do you like? She just wants it to be big and shiny. It needs to be a diamond and it needs to be expensive. Fuck the, the love part of it. It needs to be expensive. So it, it's really interesting how far this has gone. And she's like a scientist and a researcher. And she understands all of these concepts and she still can't see past it. So that's because other people can't see past it. It's just, yes, it's because other people can't see past it. It's, it's really very interesting because it has been so well ingrained as that science. If you love me, you'll give me a huge rock. So this is an example. The reason I bring this up is this is an amazing example of manipulation on a worldwide level. One person took a behavioral economic concept of rareness and changed the opinion, the industry made zillionaires out of all these people forever because they manipulated a group of people effectively. That's what, I mean, the marketing for this, amazing. Because it lasted forever. I mean, you have all these Geico commercials where you had a gecko and you had a caveman. They can't keep those forever. The diamond industry, De Beers gets to keep that logo forever because it is so good at what it does. I mean, it's, it's truly, I mean, it might, I find it absolutely amazing because think about what other industries have been able to do that, to change a behavior of an entire nation in one fell swoop for many lifetimes. It's absolutely ridiculous to think about. So it's, it's a great thing of, uh, of manipulation for fun and profit. What's my time? I know that I, I'm suddenly going to get like 10 minutes and then I'm going to have to like speedy Gonzales through this. Do we know? It's 11 and 18. You got plenty of time. Great. 30 minutes. 30 minutes. Okay. So the next thing, let's just say that, okay, we, we've scared the shit out of somebody to give us a date. We bought them diamonds to tell them we love them. And now we are going to have animals, kids, which could be very similar. Um, and now we need to know, how do we need to train anyone in anything? Because this is important. Which this is, this gets at the core of behavior analysis from like a person, like a human perspective, or just from an animal perspective. Um, there's two ba basic things that you need to know for training anyone. Punishment and reward. These two things are extremely simple. So, sorry, just so for clarification, this would be the punishment. And this would be the reward. <laughs> um, <laughs> so you know. um, this is one of the commonly unknown things anywhere I go. And that somebody will be talking and they'll be like, oh, well, somebody made a loud noise when I did something wrong that was positive reinforcement. I'm like, nope, that was not. Absolutely not. Um, there's two things to consider here. You have punishment and reinforcement. And this is the main thing. Punishment, you want to get rid of the behavior. You want it to go away. Don't reinforce somebody if you want it to go away. I mean, it makes sense. If I want you to take out the trash, which I feel I've asked Chris this before, and he says, I do that all the time for my wife. I love her so much. Um, because Chris is a good guy. <laughs> you don't? You don't I said I'm pwned. He's pwned. Anyway, so with the, if you wanted somebody to take out the trash, you want to increase behavior, you're not going to punish them every time they do it, because that's going to make them stop. So punishment is all about taking away behavior. Reinforcement is all about bringing in behavior. When somebody does something you like, you give them something, whether it's social reinforcement, whatever it might be, good job. Um, that, that, that's that kind of thing. Then you have the positive and you have the negative side. The positive being you're adding something. Makes sense. It, you can have positive punishment. You're adding an aversive thing to take away behavior. So if you made a really loud noise because you want somebody to stop doing something, you are adding a punishment. It's positive punishment. So. How do you use this to train anyone in anything? So, I mean, everyone knows how to train them. I feel, does anyone have dogs? 
Yeah, I don't have kids, I hate them. So we have to talk about dogs. Um, I'm sorry. Uh, I mean, kids are cute for everyone else, and that's completely fine, but I get on planes with them, and I, bastards. <laughs> There's one little, I'm sorry, I'm gonna digress a little, since I have 30 minutes. <laughs> um, I uh, sat in a plane, and I was, it was a long plane ride, and this stupid little kid behind me, I'm sure none of your kids are like this, um, started kicking my seat, and I was like, okay, I can handle this for like 30 seconds, really kicking my seat, and I turn around, I kind of give the, the parent like, hey, your little offspring is, uh, is kicking my seat, <laughs> and they're like, oh, so of course they do like a, oh, pat the head kind of thing, like, oh, my child, you know, kids do things, I'm like, no, so back around, the kid continues to kick my seat, I turn and look at the parent again one more time, Kid does it again, and by this time I'm pissed because I've now spilled something on myself, almost on my laptop, in which case that child would have gone out the window. Um, and I turn around and go, you don't want to kick my seat anymore. And he's like, why? He's like, because the pilot will throw you off the plane. And the kid stopped. I know it was really mean, but I was really tired. But I stopped. The, horror, the worst part about it, and I feel bad for this part, the parent did not do anything. They didn't go, hey, lady, that's mean. She was just like, hmm. It's like, I just threatened your child. <laughs> Um, so, on that note, though, I don't want, kids are cute, but we're going to talk about dogs, So, because I have an amazing one. Uh, so, to train animals, uh, I, uh, my boyfriend decided he wanted to give the dog a leash, or not a leash, a collar that had a beer opener on it. Um, I, th I think he was wanting to call it the beer buddy, and I was like, well, they're raw. <laughs> Let's back out of the frat house just a little bit. Um, so, but I was like, okay, well, so what if he has it on there? He's like, he's got to bring it to you. So we discussed the logistics of how to do this. So in case you're curious, this is dangerous, but in case you're curious, what you have to do is you have to implement punishment and reinforcement across a period of time. One of the things, first thing you do, we put a towel on the handle to where the dog gets something rather than just chow my Great Dane Golden Retriever would just start eating the handle. So, okay, here's the towel. Now you know. Good job. <laughs> and if the towel's on there, that means you can get into the fridge. So you put a towel on there, of course this is going to happen, and you start rewarding the dog, giving him treats, whatever it is that they want. Um, you start rewarding the dog for touching and pulling open the fridge, right? Well, great, good job, you're doing this, this is exciting. And then you start fading that out to where they're in the fridge, but they need reinforcement for something. Then you start labeling something in there. Usually I just put like a, like a toy in there, like a very distinctive red toy that he likes a lot. He got the toy, he opens the fridge, gets the toy out of it. Good job, you have reinforcement. Wait, go. We keep going with this. Now we put the like red around the beer, which is really easy, if you, I guess, if you do red label or something. Um, and then now you start rewarding the dog for bringing it to you. So you have the activity. And the reason that this gets a little dangerous is, well, now your dog has ultimate access to the buffet known as your fridge. So that's not very good, because they're suddenly going to realize, holy crap, this is where they keep the meat. <laughs> I mean that. And it's reinforcing in itself. So before that reinforcement comes to play, you have to start punishing them for touching anything that's not red or whatever you've trained. So suddenly, we now have the dog go into the, go into the fridge if you just take the towel off when, when you leave. And they, will, they know they'll get punished for anything that's not red. So make sure your beers are red. Put a koozie on or whatever you want. And ta-da, your dog can now train, can now fetch you a beer. You can do the same thing with your child, but <laughs> I feel like once communication is established, you probably just do it that way. <laughs> but yeah, so to train anyone on anything, this is another way of manipulation. It's kind of interesting because punishment and reinforcement can be subtle. It can be enormous. Um, it can be big, grand gestures of large things, or it can be as simple as social reinforcement. A lot of what we do um, and a lot of what happens, like training, a big thing with cults, uh, the big success behind a cult is that you isolate and everyone around you is on the same thing and conformity is your reinforcer. Everybody believes the same thing. If you ever go, I don't know how I feel about that, you're going to get kicked out of your conformist group, your group. They're going to shun you, and that's punishment. That's why nobody rebels. And if they do, you have shows like The Amish Group, or whatever those Amish shows are on TV, where the Amish kids like left. Oh my gracious. Anyway, mm -hmm. so this is always fun here. Sorry, guys. It keeps going away. So how to train anyone in anything. So that's fun. Well, now we have our kids, we have all this stuff. We know we want to live. We have our, we've scared the crap out of our wife, husband, partner, whatever it is. Um, we are training animals and kids, and now we want to live a long and healthy life. And one day we look at ourselves and realize that we look like this, but want to look like that. 
Um, and we think it's that, but it's really this. We are large, we are smoking or doing some other funky habit, and now it's time we've implemented all these like manipulations upon everyone else. Now we have to manipulate ourselves, which always happens, and that's fine. Um, and this happens. So how, does, how do these things come about? There's a lot of people that are completely comfortable with how they are, and that's totally fine. But then you have people that suddenly wake up one day, and this could actually be the partner, and go, oh my gosh, you're, you're different than you used to be. Why is it suddenly that way? And of course, now you have like, do my jeans make me look fat? No, your ass makes you look fat, and it's a problem. So why does this happen? Well, for the top one, it's usually desensitization. What you have here is if you see the person every day and they're slowly changing to something different, it could be something amazing and you suddenly realize, oh, this is great. I need to have a glimmer of hope in here. I feel bad. I feel very down with marriage right now. Um, so you have desensitization. You, you don't have enough of a change. It's called the just noticeable difference, and I'm sure most of you know what it is, to where you can't do small changes throughout you're not going to notice them necessarily. It has to be a certain magnitude. So when somebody, it's not like somebody walks in the next morning, holy crap, I gained 50 pounds. Yes, you would notice that. Um, it's slowly over time. And usually what ends up happening, um, that's desensitization. Usually what ends up happening is there's a comparison that comes about. Um, if it's yourself, you usually end up standing next to somebody that you know what you looked like before. You see a picture and go, oh my gosh, what am I going to do? Um, or it could be, that somebody else does the same thing and it comes to your attention and all of a sudden you realize, holy crap. Most people don't necessarily look at themselves. If, if clothes just kept fitting the same way, most people would have a very hard, and, and you lived in a bubble, most people have a very hard time realizing how they look, if it was any different, if they were smaller, if they were bigger, whatever it is, because the, they have no way of seeing it. So the way you battle this, it's not, this has really gotta be for yourself, unless you really don't like your relationship, is that you make, that's where, that's where you have all these uh, kind of like biohackers, but uh, people that really measure everything they do. You got weight, you got all this stuff. It's an attempt to see this change and watch it to where you know you have visual indicators, you have all these metrics, you have all these, all these graphs to see, holy crap, a month ago, I weighed 10 pounds less and I also started running. This is interesting, now I know. It's an attempt to gain control of this desensitization to where you don't become desensitized and go to this point of no control. So that, that's one of the things you can do. I have, a, I have another friend, I don't suggest this habit, but she does it anyway. She takes a picture of herself every week in the same outfit so that she knows what she looks like. I think it was a, kind of like an egomaniac thing at first, but then she was able to see like when things changed, so now she's like obsessed with it. But still, like I said, don't suggest it. Um, but this, that's her attempt to get over desensitization. What about things, and I'm gonna go back a second. What about things like social smoking? How many of you guys are a social smoker? Okay, Do you, how many of you actually think social smoking is bullshit? Okay, some of you. Okay, regardless, um, it's not actually bullshit. Um, social smoking is an interesting phenomenon in pairing. It's an effective pairing technique um, where, because I've had friends that in behavior analysis, they're like, this is ridiculous, you're a smoker, you smoke. Be like, no, I don't smoke. I, no, I don't personally smoke. But the other argument is, no, I don't ever have a need to smoke unless I'm doing X. Most people, it's like go to a bar, or you're around a certain group of friends that smoke. For a lot of people, I had a, uh, my a really good friend of mine. He smoked at work because that was how he was able to get a break. Which means that when that was no longer like you could just take a break, he had still paired that. And that's what this concept of social smoking is, is that you don't actually have this generalized idea, this generalized pairing of smoking, it's that you or someone else has effectively paired that activity with that environment. And this can happen with anything. This can be with eating, this can be with smoking, exercising, some people exercise around other people better. It's a lack of generalization. Um, and generalization is that is when you effectively train someone and it goes across all aspects of their life. Essentially, you like that to do with the users. You don't want users to just sit in their office and do everything you tell them to. Then we want them to go home and apply it as well, usually, so that you don't have to deal with their shit when they're at home. Um, this is the same thing. You want to generalize all this stuff. Um, social smoking is one of those things that it's not that way. Um, they've effectively isolated it to here. I'm at a bar. I want a cigarette. I want to leave the bar. I don't want a cigarette because I want to do this. Um, this is one of those things. It's, it's one of those ways to create habits and superstitions and stuff like that. It's how you effectively pair stuff. Um, actually, uh, back onto marriage, uh, one of my old professors, who's now divorced, 
uh, used to describe his wife as effective pairing of a euphoric stimulation of cigarettes. That was, that was their marriage. Uh, the reason that they got together, and he says, and she just loved it, was that they would go on smoke breaks together, so he effectively paired, back to like scaring the shit out of your date, he had effectively gotten himself paired with the euphoric experience of cigarette smoke, and she attributed it to him. So they got married, had two kids, got divorced, and he's now with some French girl. So, anyway, here you go, more manipulation, now you know. Give me a second, I'm gonna speed through this for a moment. So we got desensitization, effective pairing, and delay of consequences. As far as um, the living a long and healthy lifestyle and how to, how to really bring it in for yourself and manipulate yourself, one of the biggest problems with any sort of health-related thing is me eating a Twinkie today does not translate to what it's gonna do to me later. It's so far removed. It's essentially like back to the punishment and consequences. If you wanted to train your dog to open the door, he opens the door and in two days you reward him. He has no damn clue what that's to do. He hasn't effectively paired it, it doesn't work. That's the same problem when it comes to any health related thing. It's not an immediate reaction. We have nothing to show the immediate consequences. So a lot of people try to hack this as well, um, which is where that, that measurement comes in. You're like, hey, I ate this, I know what this does, look at my predictive measurement, kind of thing. Um, and the other thing that you have is they'll start associating other things. That's why you have other people that are like, oh, when I don't go to the gym, I don't get, I don't know, to play video games. I have no idea. Uh, my, friend, my friend uses other food. It's weird. If she doesn't go to the gym, she doesn't get certain food, but I feel like it's the wrong pairing. Um, so anyway, but this is, this is where you see a lot of those uh, weight loss programs and all this good stuff, things like The Biggest Loser. It's all about effectively pairing right there, but the problem with The Biggest Loser is it doesn't generalize. The minute they leave, we're all back to our same habits, whatever. So delay of consequences, this is another way to really create a habit and hack that whole thing. So, so we've, we've living a long and healthy life, we have our partner, we have our dog, we have our, our kids, we have all this stuff. Now we have to deal with our in-laws, which if any of you love your in-laws, then just ignore me. They're just stubborn habits and superstitions. That's all they are right now. That's all they are to me. And loads suck. So anyway, what you have here is essentially you have an older, an older group of people, and they they have they definitely have stubborn habits, just like we all have stubborn habits. But they've been doing it for a long time, and they've also been doing it with these offspring. They established these habits within there unknowingly sometimes, um, and it it kind of kind of sucks sometimes to deal with. Um, it's also kind of interesting to see the pairing. Like you see, oh, this happens to my partner, and there it is, and there parents. There you are. So as an example, I, uh, my, my partner's mother-in-law or my mother came to visit us the other week and she's really, she's in a habit of not trying food that is not, is outside of her wheelhouse, um, which is everything that is not McDonald's, pretty much. So we look at her and say, hey, would you like some fish? And she's like, yeah, well, I only like one type of fish. What type of fish is that? I have no idea what it was, but it was only indigenous to Australia. She's never been there. Don't know why she likes this fish. I don't like fishy fish. Oh, but I do like, not trout. Um, what is the fishiest fish you can think of? Mackerel. Mackerel? Mackerel? Yeah. I feel like she liked that one. Was it halibut? Halibut? What? It. Yeah, it, it was one of them was mackerel. She basically the only fish she liked were the ones that went into fish and chips. And I don't like fishy fish. Every fish she named to me was the fishiest fish I've ever eaten. So I was like, I'm not eating that. So all of a sudden, we have a habit, we have a problem here because she's also gonna complain. She acts like she's fine. Um, she's also gonna complain. We have a habit. I don't eat anything outside of my I don't I don't know what that is. I'm not eating that. How do you break this? Well, for me, I just said, well, this is what we're cooking. We're making carne asada. What's that? It's meat. Eat it. <laughs> um, but this is another one of those things. It's realizing habits that occur. And a lot of people, if you have a habit, um, again, with dealing with in-laws, or even with kids, um, you like to just kind of feed it. Well, this is what they always do. You're rewarding a stubborn habit. And that's a bummer. So with habits, one of the things, um, because my partner uh, has a very, he had a very similar stubbornness uh, when it came to eating food as well. So what we would do is anytime I would make something and he'd go, I don't want that. I was like, have you ever tried it? No. So I would reward him for trying it. He always liked it. But I would reward him for trying it. So suddenly I have 
broken him out of his habit. As a matter of fact, I've rewarded him and given him a habit of actually going outside of his wheelhouse, where so much so that I think we had octopus one time and he'd never had it before. And he's like, I had octopus. And he looked at me like a dog <laughs> waiting for a treat. He's like, I had octopus. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> Good dog, we're in public, I can't reward you. Um, so it was, it's really interesting. So now we've created a new habit. You address the habit and you deal with it accordingly. If I were to just be, if he was like, I don't like this, I'd be like, fine, I'll make you something else, or even worse, which is my actual like gut reaction. I don't like this. Fuck it, eat it anyways. <laughs> it's not going to work. <laughs> that means we're going to have a problem. So this is a stubborn habit. Um, I know I have another story. The other thing that we have um, is habits is usually with ways of life, um, setting things up. How many of you have, a, have had a little bit of friction in moving in with somebody? It could be a partner, it could be a roommate, whatever. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, a little bit of friction. There's a lot of people who have issues with roommates because when you get together in one space, you look at the way your space is set up. These are where the dishes go, and this is where this goes, and I don't like doing this, and the toothpaste is this way. And it's essentially one of the biggest parts of moving in with anybody is establishing the habits and figuring out, eat one, nobody's gonna sink completely. So you either do the completely weird OCD thing that my two roommate friends did, and they essentially like had two parts of the kitchen. There was two parts of the fridge. Like they just were like, no, I'm not compromising at all. I'm setting up the way I want to, um, which was really interesting. Or you have your partner where you have to figure out a way to coexist. Um, and then of course when your in-laws come into play and they are like, no, this is where the spices go. And you come home and you go, what the hell did you do to my house? Which has happened before I came home and all my dishes were in different spots because this is where they go. I was like, um, one, I can't reach that because I'm a little short and their entire family is, is tall and I'm like, and now I can't find anything. Uh, so I essentially walked out, I looked at my, I looked at Greg, I walked out, I said, I need all that to be fixed when I get back, okay? Yeah. <laughs> I left. Um, but this is what these habits are, and manipulating the situation is realizing what's going on. And again, this, this gets back to very, you have to manipulate yourself as well. You have to figure out what is a do or die thing for me. And pick those things. Let's say it happens to be that the spices are on the counter for some reason. And then figuring out how to get them to change. Rewarding them for it, punishing them for not doing it that way. Who knows? Depends on what's most effective. But that's that idea of, of co-creating habits. Because if you actually don't manipulate the situation, whether you or them, what you end up having is 20 years later, this thing I, did you say you were pooned? Yeah. Yeah, but not for Chris. But you have people that you essentially all of a sudden look at your life and you realize, I still have these habits and it annoys the shit out of me that we're not doing it, okay? So that's, this is essentially what happens. So you have these habits, it's way fun. Um, what, do we know what time it is now? 10 minutes. Minutes. Well, the other thing we have here is superstitions. I always like to talk about superstitions when we come to habits because superstitions are essentially a slightly neurotic habit. Okay. Uh, what are some? Do you, and does anyone have a superstition here at all? Mm -hmm. Nobody. What what kind of superstitions do you? Have? What do you have? Um, probably my biggest superstition is like no matter what, like even if I'm on the small blind, I will never play the hand seven ten in poker. Never. Okay. Why is that? Because it reminds me of seven ten splits in bowling, and seven ten <laughs> splits suck. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So no, no seven tens on in in poker. What was yours? Um, just about how things are have to be cleaned or set up. Um, that is like. I have certain knickknacks, and if they're not where they are when I leave, then I'll have bad luck the whole day, so I have to like, set them up, and it has to be good before I leave. It has to be that way. <laughs> Any other one? That you, yes? My mom taught me you never throw away keys, because you're throwing away your security. So I have a key ring. Holy crap, your mom's a genius. <laughs> <laughs> I, have, I have a key ring at home that's about this big, that's filled with every key that I've, ever like, for every apartment, every place I've ever lived. Wow. <laughs> Anyone else? Any or, or superstitions you know? Go ahead. Don't ever say seven at a craps table. <laughs> okay. Have you ever? Yeah. No. I mean, just it's all different. I mean, and then of course you have the knock on wood thing. You have to knock on wood or something that's around you. If you say something, throwing salt over your shoulder. You have baseball. I love baseball. I was going to tell you guys about the superstition. Of, do you know? Does any raise your hand if you know that baseball players don't step on the foul line? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Somebody told me that nobody would understand. Anyway, baseball players are going to step on a foul line because they think it's bad luck. But there's all, baseball players are some of the most superstitious yeah. athletes in the world. Yes, yeah, some of them are really good. Um, this 
his giant's, uh, the beard, but he's a pitcher. And there's a lot of guys that do the same thing. They have the playoff beard. They do not cut their beard during the playoffs um, because they're scared of bad luck. Uh, you have things with socks. You have boxers that want to have sex before um, a fight. There's a whole bunch of superstitions. And some of them are personal to where we've learned them through life, and some of them are things that have been passed on. And the difference, it's essentially a habit, because like you described the knickknack, it's a habit, but it's associated with an outcome. It's associated with a performance, and that's exactly where they stem from. Um, usually, uh, baseball superstitions and other athletic-based superstitions were based in an extreme performance. You did something really good, and you're not gonna attribute it to yourself because that's hard to control. You're just like, oh, well then if I messed up, it's me. Um, you start finding something else. You're like, oh, I, I, didn't, I have a longer beard. I've been doing this. I need to keep doing this. I, don't, I need to not change anything. Oh my gosh. Um, and that's what this is associated with, is an extreme performance that you externalize. In which case, it's extremely easy to make a superstition, because all you have to do is find like a TV scrambler or anything that messes with things like artificially, and you get your friend, person, dog, cat, whatever, um, to suddenly associate their performance with doing some crazy thing you've asked them to do. And I've, I've seen... Um, I've seen this done, I used to teach undergrads, in which case I'd bring somebody in, and beforehand I would have the class, 300 people, decide on a behavior they wanted them to do. Sometimes it was crazy, like take off the tie. And sometimes it was like get on the desk for some reason. And the person didn't know what was going on, but they would start rewarding them the closer they got to this behavior. And one person really backfired on because it was really, really effective and they had no idea what was going on. And I didn't tell them because it was funny and they were my friend. Um, but it was the take off the tie thing. And from this day, he always takes off his tie because he thought it was an amazing class. He had such a great class. Well, of course, 300 people are clapping at you. So you're like, oh, this is great. They just love me. He takes off his tie before every lesson. Um, it's a super, even after I told him, hey, dude, no, I kind of planned that. He doesn't care. So how do you wake people from superstitions? That's a real, it's a very good question, and it's very hard to do. Because you essentially have to put them in a situation where that, like, they performed, and it, they didn't have it anymore. Like, OK, we cut off the beard for some reason. But the problem with it, though, is superstitions are just like habits. You can explain them away so easily. You externalize it to something else. Oh, well, I didn't have, you didn't have your playoff beard, but you were, it was the best pitch of the season for you. Yeah, well, I didn't change my socks. They, they find something else to externalize. Yeah, you, it, it's, they'll find something else to replace it. That's why, I mean, I'll even admit to it. There's times where I'll say something like, I'll say something that I really don't want to happen, and even though I don't believe in it, I might, you know, I don't even be wood, but I'll knock on something. It's ridiculous, but it's, it's also this whole, it's almost like a just in case. It's not a lot of effort. Um, and you just don't want to go through it. So yeah, it's very, very difficult to, to break superstitions because it can always, always be externalized. And that's why somebody that their life is, is bore with superstitions, it's really, you can't really break it from them. They go through therapy for a very long time and it just does not work. So more manipulations of superstition. So all in all, what we have here today, we're gonna, we're to do this thing. I had Diamonds Fitness and Cults, Manipulation for Fun and Profit, and eventually just turned into Diamonds Fitness and In-Laws, Manipulation for Life, Love, and a Wig and Six Pack. <laughs> I think I have five minutes. Do you guys have any questions? It's kind of not really. What, 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 what's, what's the theory on this hypnosis? How come some people hypnosis? are- Hypnosis? Yeah, some people are- I went to um, the show, I wasn't hypnotized. Yeah, you know, did you believe it would work? Mm, I was just kind of like, hey, give it a try, but I wasn't anyone else yet. Everyone else seemed to be yeah. into it. Hypnosis is um, it's a, it's a great uh, manipulation technique, but it only works on people who believe. It's like, kind of like seeing ghosts. If you don't believe in ghosts, an actual like ghostly figure could go in front of you, and it's very similar to the superstition. You explain it away to something else. But if you believe in stuff like that, if you believe in hypnosis, if you believe in ghosts, you can create anything. Um, so yeah, hypnosis is all about the ability to influence you. So yeah, I, I can't get hypnotized uh, because I don't. Yeah, but just me, like, statistically though, it seems a lot of people are able to be hypnotized. Yeah, because a lot of people are, are able to be influenced. Yeah. yeah. Um, I actually had a couple of questions. Uh, okay, I'm just prepared. Yeah. <laughs> um, the synesthetization. Uh, how is that different from intentional change blindness in the current environment? Is there a different normal? Uh, neurological basis for one versus the other? That's a good question. Um, so attentional, like the attentional blindness um, and anything like you have something in your glasses and it goes away, that is 
like basic neural level, whereas desensitization is, it's not a, it, you're not noticing the change uh, because you're not getting enough change. That is a matter of, like for example, in the glasses, um, an attentional blindness. It's this idea that something's staying there and your neurons are extremely effective, so it, it basically goes, okay, I don't need to pay attention to it anymore. It literally is leaving it alone. I mean, it's ignoring it. Whereas desensitization is, uh, it's kind of like the, the volume knob, it's exactly the volume knob, the just noticeable difference, is that it doesn't actually go up the same degree every number. It has to increase by a certain percentage. Um, otherwise, you won't notice the change. So let's like, say from one to two was actually one to two. Nine to 10, you're not gonna notice it. It actually has to increase by a certain percentage, which is usually about 10%. So that's the difference, it's a very good question, but that's the difference is one is actually a neural level, some are neural level, I'm ignoring it, and the other one is just that I haven't given you enough information to even notice that it's a difference. Did you said you had another question? Yeah, I did. Um, so when you mentioned smoking, yeah. um, I, what about other behaviors and if the environment has changed? So a big, like not allowed to drink in a certain area, or not allowed to, uh, congregate because somebody's moved a, a table yeah. from a location. Can that be enough to break those behaviors or does it require even more dislocation? It really, that again, it depends on when you're training up these behaviors, um, it really depends on how well you have generalized or specified. Um, sometimes you want it to be this table, in which case moving the table, taking the table away, changing the tablecloth color could be enough to be like, oh, I don't really want to do that anymore. But for some people, even though it's at the table, they might actually consider it the room. Or they might have generalized it in general. You have the people with you and they've generalized it all around. Is there a way to, to, to figure how, how people respond to those things? Is there a, a, a way that they respond to an environment differently uh, that you might be able to draw away so you could say that that's been affected? Oh, yeah. Um, there's entire behavior analysis uh, model plans, essentially, that are all about that. You do something called a functional analysis, and then you do um, analysis of its generalization, um, and then you start doing a whole bunch of things, and you real you figure out okay how far have they I've trained up the behavior how far has it gone, and you, once you figure that out, then you start expanding it out or narrowing it in um, through punishment and reinforcement. So yeah, there's um, an entire area of people which, so which it's I, yeah pretty sophisticated. For, it's pretty extensive. There's entire there's people that their entire job is to just do a functional analysis. I had one more. Yeah, okay. Anyone else? Do you have any questions? He has one more. Super systems uh, versus other belief systems, uh, either like uh, you're saying like religious belief systems, religious or uh, I don't know, marketing, yeah, multiple level marketing. Yeah, are they the same psychology pretty much, or is there a is there a contrast between simple superstition and a, a greater belief system? Um, the greater belief system, anyone that's massively religious don't don't like hurt me later. Um, they are born on a lot of superstition. Um, but it's not just superstition. Uh, especially, especially the original uh, like form of Christianity, that was a lifestyle. Um, in which case, there was superstition behind it to kind of get things going and, and to be like, why is this? Well, because, because this happened. But the biggest, a big part of it was the fact that it wasn't just Sunday. Your entire life was dictated by this belief system. So that's why it was so closely ingrained. And getting to a, a political, it's very ish, the similar as well is that it's so ingrained in there as a lifestyle. So it's, it's hard to, to separate it out. Okay, well, it looks like we're done. So if you have any other questions, let me know. Thank you. Thank you all. Up next in this room is vulnerability and exploit trends. I have Schweig for the folks that I couldn't.